Well, it's such a great song to, uh, to sing at this time where our church is at, not only because we're going through Genesis, which is the story of how God brought so many beautiful things out of nothing, but also for our church, especially as we go through different transitions, as Pastor Brian and Pastor Jeff uh, leave us with this vision of the neighborhood church and how so many beautiful things can come out of that. So uh, such a great song to be singing. Um, and it leads perfectly. It's, it's really nice for me to have that transition to go straight into Genesis because, uh, as I said, Genesis is all about how God brings beautiful things out of nothing. Uh, and we have been studying that as a church here now for the last couple of weeks. Uh, the story of God, the story of how God uh, brought everything out of nothing and also how he brought us out of nothing. And that's where we're going to be uh, looking today, not only at that story, but how especially uh, how God brought us uh, together. Um, now, I thought a good way to kind of introduce this was to talk about uh, parents and children, because what we're really talking about tonight is the image of God. And uh, there's nothing I think paints a picture of what the image of God is really all about than uh, seeing parents and children. Uh, I have a picture of my family here. There we go. I'm the really good looking one. Um, and then uh, that's my grumpy son in the middle, my beautiful wife. Despite my son's look on his face, I promise that we treat him with care and love. He looks miserable in that picture. I've d been dying to get a picture of him where he's smiling so that I can look like a good dad, but... Uh, I think he's really upset because we interrupted his place so that we could take a selfie. I just got a selfie stick and I was trying to test it out. But uh, yeah, so parents and children, uh, when I became a dad about a year and a half ago, one of the things I was most excited about is seeing how my son, how my child was going to look a little bit like me, a little bit like my wife. I was excited to see, you know, who was going to be in his face, what kind of things would we see. Uh, and sure enough, when he came into the world, it was very clear that it was all my wife, which is probably a really good thing for him. He doesn't want my ears or my premature baldness. That would end badly for him. Um, but uh, he came out, he looked exactly like my wife. It was so amazing to see how this little child could look so much like one of us already, even in his first few hours of his life. Um, and as he's grown, it's been so much fun to continue to see the little things that will come out. Uh, he is uh, not only now looking like us, he's starting to act a little bit like us in different ways. For example, my wife is extremely organized and tidy. She likes things very neat. And in some bizarre twist, he might be the only year and a half year old I know who likes to put things away after he's done playing. I mean, he, he will get mad if you do not put his toys and blocks in the right boxes. So even, even now we're starting to see these little things come out. You know, he's a lot like us. And that's exactly what the image of God is really all about. It's about the way that we were created as people to image someone, to have a resemblance to someone, to have a likeness to someone. Uh, so we want to go ahead and take a look at this. And, and as we do, it's important to remember that this is one of the most fundamental doctrines in all of Christianity. I mean, uh, something that Pastor Jeff mentioned when he spoke on this topic last week is that it's hard to overstate just how important the idea of the image of God is because it affects absolutely everything. From this point forward as we go through the Bible, the image of God is gonna have a role to play in everything that happens, uh, not only in the Old Testament, but in everything that's to come in the New Testament as well. Um, and as we look at this, I want us to be asking one question behind everything, and that is, why would God make us this way? Why would God decide that he wants his image on us? Why, why would he do that? Uh, so let's go ahead and open up our Bibles if you do have them. We're going to be reading from Genesis 1, uh, verses 25 through 31. It reads that God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. 
So right now we're on day six uh, from the creation of the world. God has done a lot of amazing things with the power of his word. He has separated night from day. He's created mountains and valleys and oceans, beds in the heavens, uh, beasts on the ground. And uh, now we get to a moment where God kind of pauses for a second. And uh, it's such an interesting moment because up to now, God has just kind of been firing things off. He's just been creating. He's just been going and going and going and doing these incredible things. And then all of a sudden, there's kind of this this pause right at uh, verse 26. And he says, let's make man in our image. And, and we should feel a little bit of gravity to this because this is, this is kind of interesting. God has been just going, 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 as I've said, and, and yet now he's stopping. So whatever's about to come, whatever's about to happen is clearly very important. And, and indeed, after God has finished creating man, it's the first time that he goes from saying that creation is good to saying that it's very good. Uh, and in, in Hebrew, if we could read that and understand it in its uh, original meaning, what God says is afraid me'od to of, and what that means is very good. But what we lose in that English translation is that when he's saying very, uh, that Hebrew word ma'od means forceful, it means weighty and excessive. So he's not just saying it's gone up a little bit in standard, he's saying this is it. This is the very thing that m- takes it from being good to being great. This, there's some kind of weight here in what's happened. And so what we want to do tonight is to try and understand, well, what is that weight? Again, that question of why would God make us this way? You know, C.S. Lewis, Pastor Jeff's favorite speaker, I wouldn't really be doing justice if I didn't mention him, right? Well, he said that we have never met any ordinary people, that in all of our travels, we've never met just a mere mortal. And what C.S. Lewis is saying in that is he's kind of getting onto this idea of what makes the image of God so important and so heavy and so very good. And that's that we are all so unique. We are all so valuable in the eyes of God. So let's take a look at at what difference it makes. I mean, if God has really made us in his image and we're trying to find out what the reason for that is, then let's take a look at what exactly is the difference that it makes. I want to start this by looking at the idea of value because I said a moment ago that the image of God means that we are valuable. So what does that mean? I I don't suppose uh, many people have probably asked themselves this question. And I found myself asking this question as I was preparing this sermon. But how is it that we decide uh, how or how valuable something is. Um, The reason I ask that is we kind of take for granted in our lives that things are valuable, uh, especially people. We just kind of just take it there for granted that people are valuable. Uh, You know, no one ever questions, well, is that guy valuable or is this person valuable? But we never really ask the question of, well, what is it that makes people valuable? We just kind of take it for granted. Uh, And uh, it's a question really that nothing else in creation can really help us answer because if we try to approach this idea of value with something like science, for example, uh, science can't really answer that question. Science and and logic can't tell us why something or someone is valuable. It can tell us that we're very complex. It can explain the different chemistry in our bodies or perhaps why we feel a certain way in terms of you know, what, what processes are going on in our minds and in our bodies that make us feel a certain way, but it can't explain value at its base level. It can't tell me why I am valuable as a human being. You see, value and significance really, if we think about it, is, is nothing but some kind of unknown compulsion in us. We feel it, but we don't exactly know why. Even people who are not religious, they have really strong beliefs about value, uh, about things that are important in life. Uh, I was trying to think through this idea uh, about a year ago when I was uh, speaking to some high school students here at church and I was doing a sermon on uh, authenticity and value. And so I thought it would be interesting to take a look online and see what what kind of things people have found valuable. And of course, because it was for high school students, I needed to make it interesting, so I thought I would look for the weirdest things that have sold for the highest prices. So uh, I went online and I took a look at things on like eBay and Amazon uh, and found some strange things that have sold for high prices. For example, one thing I found was Michael Jordan's uh, basketball hoop from the last game he played with the Bulls, sold for thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, the list only got weirder from there. I found a piece of chewing gum that Britney Spears had spat out at a concert. Someone managed to sell it for thousands of dollars. Um, I think the grossest one was John Lennon's molar. Someone had somehow got their hands on that and sold that for thousands of dollars. But just really bizarre things that people are paying so much money for because they see them as valuable. Uh, and it, it makes you wonder, and the point I was trying to make to the high school students, why is it people would pay so much money for something like that? 
And when we think about it, the reason is because of what it's associated with, right? The reason that that basketball hoop is, is so expensive is because it was the last one that Michael Jordan played with, with the Bulls, before he ended his career. So it's priceless, it's one of a kind. It's valuable because of who it's associated with. And that's kind of how the image of God works. We have value in God's eyes because of who we are associated with, because of whose image we are made in. It's not something that's intrinsic to us. We're not just valuable because we are. We're valuable because we have the image of God who is valuable. In Christianity, we believe that God is the source of everything that's good in the universe. Every good experience that we've ever had was his idea. If you look at a color and you think that that color is beautiful, the chemistry that's happening in your body to, to help you experience that, that was God's idea. He created that. When you eat food that tastes good or when you have a relationship that makes you feel in love, those are all things that were created by God. He's the source of all those things. So if he is the creator of all that's good and beautiful and wonderful, then the fact that we have his image means that we bear the image of the thing that is the most valuable and the most important and the most beautiful in all the universe. And so that's why it's significant that we have his image is because it's, it's imprinting on us the thing that is more valuable than anything else in the universe. To kind of further make this point, I wanna tell you guys a story that I had uh, from a pastor called Tim Keller in New York, where he was meeting with some people who were interested in Christianity, but didn't really have any beliefs, and so he decided he would meet with them, sit down, and kind of talk about uh, what they believed. Uh, and so at the beginning of their meeting, he thought he would open up the conversation by just asking, well, I know you guys don't believe in God, but what's something that you really do believe in? What's something that you're passionate about that you uh, get uh, excited about? And so the woman uh, from the couple decided to speak first. She said, well, I really believe in, in women's rights. I think it's really important for women's rights to be defended uh, and upheld. And Tim Keller said, yeah, I do too. That's great. I actually, I believe that because I believe women are created in the image of God. So they have an inherent value and dignity that should be protected and should be cared for. He said, but I, I know you don't believe in God, so why is it that you believe that? And she kind of thought for a minute, and she didn't have anything uh, straight away. And a long story short, they kind of enter into a discussion about, well, why, why is it that you believe this? And they talked about, is it because human beings are more complex than animals? Is that, is that why we have rights, and is that why uh, women's rights should be defended? But at the end of the day, she couldn't really answer that question definitively. She couldn't get to the heart of it. And again, that's because when you take God away, and you base value and you base rights on something uh, like your feelings or uh, what culture says or, or what society says, then it's subject to change. There's no real foundation there. But you see, the, the image of God is eternal. It doesn't change. You have value eternally regardless of what your circumstances are, regardless of what other people say about you. Uh, God has imprinted value on you by imprinting his own image on you. The second reason that the image of God is significant uh, is, is something that I think is really interesting. If we look uh, at that passage, we'll see that when God comes to make man in verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image, which is kind of unusual, isn't it? That we're seeing God create things and he's, he's saying our. So who's he talking to right there? Uh, well, a lot of people think, well, maybe he's talking to angels. Maybe this is the heavenly court and the heavenly beings. But we're not really created in the image of God and angels, so it, it can't be that. Uh, and some others think that maybe God is speaking in the kind of royal sense, that he's saying, let, let us make uh, man in God's image, but he's still talking about just himself. But I have another idea, and I tend to agree with some scholars out there who think that this is the first instance in the Bible in which God is hinting at his Trinitarian nature. As Christians, we believe, and, and we sang a song uh, here tonight when we were singing uh, that God is three persons in one. And we believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that he is one God, but in some mysterious way, he's also three persons. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So part of what the image of God is, is not only an individual image, but it's an image of community. Because before there was anything else, God still had community in and of himself. Uh, and so if God is going to create us in his image, he needs to have that uh, in us as well. And that is why we have male and female. That's why we... Uh, are a race of beings and not just individual people that God wanted to talk to. Community is important to God and it's important to the image of God if we're going to understand that rightly. 
But again, we haven't really got to what kind of difference this is making at this point. I mean, there's some interesting things there about what the image of God is, and it certainly, as I've said, it gives us a reason to understand value, but what does it mean to put it into practice? So if we look at the practice of the image of God, I think, again, there's two things we can pull from that. The first is, uh, as we've kind of touched on, is that it gives us a basis for human rights and human dignity. I mean, if we believe that human beings are created in the image of God, then it, it necessarily means that we have to value life from beginning to end in all of its forms, that there can't be any life that's less important or less significant than any other because everyone has the image of God. That means even in the womb, even before we have met our children, before I met my son, he was valuable because he bore the image of God in his mother's womb. That means that when I get older and my son is caring for me and perhaps I don't have some of the same abilities that I had when I was a younger man, I'll still be valuable in God's eyes. I'll still be significant and important. Again, not because I've done something or brought something to the table. In fact, quite the opposite. It, it's, it's the very reason that I haven't got anything to offer. It's because I bear the image of he who has everything, who's most valuable. I mean, this, this really makes a significant difference especially the people who would have been reading Genesis for the first time. It's, it's thought that Genesis was probably put together somewhere around the 6th century BC. That's not a comment on maybe when the earth was made. It's more of a comment of when was this story kind of put together and put down on paper. And uh, it, it, at that time, the cultures around the Hebrew people, uh, the people that God had called for himself, uh, probably had ideas about human dignity in life that did not match up with this. It was a common practice in the ancient Middle East that uh, human lives that were born with disabilities or infirmities, children would just be killed. Uh, in, in some instances, of course, in religions, uh, children would be sacrificed, lives would be sacrificed to gods. Um, so it, it was just a very dark and, and not a very pleasant picture at all of what human beings were worth. They were considered, uh, for the most part, expendable. Certainly if you had any kind of uh, disability or infirmity, um, but the, the difference that God is saying is he's like, I'm not going to operate like these other gods. I'm not going to operate uh, like these other cultures. I, I'm going to make sure that my people know that they're created in the image of God, and so every life is significant. Every life is important. The other thing that, uh, that this really makes a difference in is the fact that we as Christians, as a Christian community, should value community, that it shouldn't be something we move to the side um, I'm part of a generation that I think has probably moved church to the side a little bit. We like to stay home and blog and, and maybe watch our sermons online, something like that. But the reason why I think that that's kind of sad is because part of imaging God means being in community. That's the reason why we as a church and why Pastor Jeff values something like the bestseller book club so much is because if we are to image God and we're to truly understand what that means, we have to be in community. One of the most famous things Jesus ever said was, love your neighbor as yourself. And we could use the same logic we were using earlier and ask the question, well, why would he say something like that? Why is that so important to God that we should love our neighbor as ourself? It's certainly something that's good. It's good to love people. It's kind. But I think there's a deeper meaning, and it's, it's that because God is loving, and so in order to image that loving God, we have to love people around us. We have to value community. If we don't want to do those things, or we want to put that to the side, then we're not going to be imaging God correctly. Because again, God is community and part of his nature. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can't image that if we are not going to be with others. That doesn't mean that you have to be an extrovert, of course. You can be an introvert and love community. But it does mean that you've got to have some kind of a commitment to relationships outside of yourself. Uh, it's, uh, it's become a common thing, again, amongst my generation to say that a relationship with Jesus is just entirely vertical. It's all about you and it's all about God. And that's, it's not untrue, but it's not the whole truth, is it? Part of, of having a relationship with God means as well having a relationship with his people, with his church. If we don't have that, then again, we're not imaging God the way that he is. There's, there's a real problem though as we, as we kind of dig more into this. Because I think now we're starting to get a picture of why this is important uh, and why it matters to God. But we tend to have a real image problem in our society, in our culture. And so we struggle with this a little bit because we are not so different than those ancient cultures that I'm, I mentioned a moment ago. You see, in those cultures where human lives were expendable or rights and dignity weren't defended in some of the ways that we might think are right today, 
Um, it was because those people were trying to craft an image for themselves, whether that was for some kind of ancient deity or God, and they wanted to present themselves in a certain way to that God, uh, or whether it was they just wanted to present themselves to other people around them as important. It's just kind of been a habit throughout human history that human beings like to craft an image for ourselves, but that, that is not what God said about us. God says that we are not to craft images for ourselves. We've been given one. We've been given the image of God. I think the best way to try and understand uh, this concept is to think of um, the image of God kind of like a mirror. And this is where my friend is going to help me out with my mirror. Thank you very much. So this is my mirror that I like to look at myself in the morning uh, and check my uh, self out in. And um, I'm sorry if I'm blinding anyone right now, by the way. But the reason I say that the image of God is kind of like a mirror is because, uh, as we all know, the way a mirror works is if you want to get an image in it, it has to face the thing that it's imaging. So in the same way, when we talk about the image of God, if we want to see what God looks like, if we want to have his image and bear his image, we have to face him. If we turn away from God, there's not going to be any image there to look at. There's not going to be anything there to see. The image of God doesn't, it's not going to be clear and apparent if we are not facing him. And this is something that Jesus touched on uh, in his ministry, in his lifetime. When Jesus was in the temple one time, he was teaching, uh, and some people who weren't big fans of Jesus decided they would come and test him and try and get him in hot water by asking him about taxes. Um, so they come and they say to Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar, uh, this Roman uh, ruler who's come and oppressed us? Uh, and Jesus says, give me a coin. So they give him a coin. He said, whose image is on this coin? And he says, well, Caesar. He says, then give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God's what is God's. What the comment that Jesus is saying there uh, and what he's inferring is that if it has Caesar's image on it, then it belongs to Caesar. You should give it to Caesar. And when he says, give to God's what is God's, he's saying whatever has God's image on it needs to go to God's. Well, what has God's image on it? It's us. We have God's image. That's the statement that Jesus is making. He's not really talking about taxes and doing the right thing with your money. He's talking about giving to God what belongs to God, which is his image. He's taken that, that very question that they've given him and he's flipped it up and says, I've got something way more important than taxes. And it's the question of, are you giving yourselves to God? Are you giving the image of God uh, back to him? Are you reflecting it like a mirror? Are you showing back to the world what God is like? You see, the, the problem is we don't really want to face God it's in our nature, it's in our very fibers of our being that we don't like to face and we like to be this way. We like to choose what it is that we're going to image. Maybe it's power, maybe it's success, maybe we don't think we're very valuable and so we want to come up with a new idea of value and we want to image that instead of God. Maybe it's that we just don't know what God looks like anymore and so we don't even know how to image him. I think it's probably all of those things. Kind of a silly story to, to paint this picture is when I was a, a kid, I really loved going to costume parties. We call them fancy dress parties in England, which just sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud. But I used to love going to them because I used to love dressing up as different characters and pretending to be um, someone that I admired or someone that I thought was interesting. And uh, at my sister's birthday party one year, she had a, a costume party, and I decided to go as the wrestler Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, if anybody who knows what Stone Cold Steve Austin actually looks like, you're probably looking at me and going, oh, that's, that's not a bad idea. He's bald. He has a beard. At the time, I was a 14-year-old skinny kid with a full head of hair and no facial hair whatsoever. Certainly didn't have the build of a professional wrestler. Uh, so I show up at this party. I've got this vest on as though I'm a wrestler, and it just looks ridiculous. I mean, I used to get called Skeleton in high school because I was so skinny and scrawny. Uh, and so it was just embarrassing. And as silly as that story is, it's a picture of what we do in our daily lives. We decide what we think is admirable and valuable and important, and we kind of dress up in whatever that is. We try and create that image. But again, remember, God's message to us here in Genesis when he says that we've been created in his image is that we cannot create an image for ourselves. It's not even an idea that we can kind of entertain and think about because it's kind of ridiculous. We already have an image. We cannot create a new one. But still we struggle with it. Our mirrors are turned away. Our mirrors are smudged or broken by the different things that have gone on in life. And so we're not reflecting God. 
So now maybe we understand why God's made us in his image. It's to image him to the world, but we've kind of come across a problem because I've just spent a little bit of time there telling us how we don't do it. Uh, and maybe, if you're being honest, you, that kind of resonates with you. You feel the ways in which your life isn't imaging uh, God. Maybe you struggle with the image that you present to the world. But the heart of the Christian message is about how God recovers that image, how he doesn't let it stay lost. So I want to talk about that for a moment, about how God recovers his image. You see, the heart of the Christian message, the whole reason this religion exists is because it's about God wanting to recover his image in the world. The gospel, which is the good news uh, of Christianity, is the story of what God did to try and get the image back. I want you to imagine for me a uh, second, uh, if you will, a beautiful piece of artwork. In fact, we don't need to imagine. I've got one here, Starry Night by Van Gogh. Uh, one of the most famous pieces of artwork in the world uh, and by a very, very gifted artist. Um, if we had that here in our, our presence tonight uh, and I took... Uh, a, a knife and slashed at that image or maybe I threw some paint all over it uh, and I damaged the image and I took away from what was there. How would we try and recover that image? How could we possibly get back what uh, Starry Night was there, that incredible image? Well, maybe uh, we could find the best artists out there and we could get someone on stage to maybe try and redraw, repaint what was there. Probably wouldn't be as good as Van Gogh. Uh, maybe we could uh, take parts that had had been damaged or broken and try and stick them back on. Um, maybe we could decide, hey, well, let's just make a new image that's just as beautiful as Starry Night, but it's something new, and we could put that on. But nothing we really do is going to get back what was originally there. And it's the same with the image of God. There's, there's lots of things that we have tried in our long years as the human race, but nothing really has brought back the image of God uh, because the only one who can get back the original image is the painter who made it in the first place. If we wanted to get the original image of Starry Night back if it was destroyed, the only way you could ever do that is to get Van Gogh back. Unfortunately, Van Gogh uh, is no longer alive, so there's not anything we can do about that. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is alive. God is not someone who left an image and then left us, and, and that's that, and we need to try and work out any problems that come up after that. You see, the gospel is a message of how as we lived in this broken world and as we lived in a world where God's image was marred uh, or turned away or disfigured in some way, he came into our very midst as his son Jesus to try and recover that image. The way that the Bible talks about Jesus is it says that he is the image of God. That's what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus. And I think that when Paul says that, he's doing it very intentionally and for a very specific reason. And it's to make us think back to Genesis. It's to make us think back to verse 26 of chapter 1 where God says, let's make man in our image. Because Jesus is that image on which we were based because he is God. So he comes into our midst, the original artist, to recover the image that's been lost. Now, the fact that he would come into our midst, I think, is good news in and of itself. Just to know that the artist would come down and uh, to be amongst us so that we could finally see what God looks like again, to have that perfect image in our midst. It doesn't matter anymore, it would seem sometimes, that, that we don't have the image of God, because now we can see Jesus. But you see, God is so much better than we can think. He's far more better than just coming and giving us a new image that we can all take a look at. He wants to recover the image in us, and so that's what Jesus came to do. He came not only to image God perfectly, but to recover the image. In Jesus, and most especially when he goes to the cross, we are seeing the image of what God is like. And not only that, but we're seeing God do what it takes, paying the highest price, doing everything he can to recover the broken image in us. He's cleaning our mirrors, he's putting them back together so that we can turn and face them again. One of the most incredible things about Jesus is that whenever he would teach a lesson, often he was teaching about himself. So when he taught that lesson about giving to God what is God's, he wasn't just telling us a nice little fable that we need to do. He wasn't just saying, hey, well, you guys need to turn back to God. He was telling us what he was going to do. He was going to go to the cross and he was going to give to God's what was God's. He was going to honor God with all of his life. And that's why Jesus 
was perfect and sinless, is so that he could give to God everything that belonged to God, so he could take the image of God, which he was, and shine it straight back at God, showing the world exactly what God was like. See, Jesus was destroyed on the cross so that we could be remade. His death and his life and his resurrection are the means by which our painting can be remade, that all the broken things on that image can be washed away and that we can finally be the image of God as we were always intended to be. This is what Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians. In chapter 3, 18, he says, And we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, what God wants to do for us and the good news of the gospel is that he wants to recover the image of God in you. He wants to give back to you that which makes you valuable. In a world that tries to rob that from you, in a world that tries to tell you, you need to make an image for yourself, you need to decide what your own value is. He wants to come and imprint on you an eternal value. And that's the good news of the gospel. So why did God create us in his image? He created us in his image so that the world could see what he was like. So the glory of his goodness and his perfection and his love and, and beauty could shine out to every corner of creation. And what is he like? He's like the God that would come to the cross to give up absolutely everything so that you could bear that image. He is someone who would come and love and give everything for people that totally rejected him and turned away from him. He's a God that wants to give back to us the, the very thing that was the very first gift that he ever gave us. What an incredible God that is. He was willing to pay the highest price. So when we read through Genesis and we see that he's made us in his image and says that he's very good, I think that our call to worship should be to turn straight back to God and say, we see your image and it is very good. Would you guys stand and pray with me tonight? Father, thank you for putting your image on us. And thank you most of all for loving us and bearing with us in all the ways that we turn away from you, the ways that we mar your image, the way that we dishonor your image. God, thank you for giving everything that it took to recover that in us. God, when we read about how good your acts in creation were, Lord, we can only say back, Lord, no, it's you. It is you who is very good. It's you, Lord. So Lord, let us rest in that this week. Let us Rest in the fact that you are the God that recovers uh, the image in us. We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen.